Welcome to Straight Talk with me, Peter Martin. I'm delighted to say my one-to-one -one this week is with Jim McAnally, a man who played for Dundee United with distinction and a number of other clubs. We'll go through that great career and, of course, look at his managerial stints, including a long spell at Peterhead. Jim, great to have you in the studio. There's so much um, that I want to talk to you about, but does... Does it all come flooding back when you think about the great managers that you've worked under? Are there some that stick in your mind that you think, God, how lucky was I? I just, I've been so blessed with, with what's happened to me in my, my football career, uh, from playing even to management. But to, to actually, I mean, I played for Billy McNeil, who was my hero. Uh, and then to go to Brian Clough, which a lot of generation of people don't actually know Brian Clough, but what a privilege it was to, to have played for that man and to have been in his company and to get to know him. Uh, wonderful. And then obviously, you know, Jim McLean, totally different aspect mm -hmm. from Brian Clough, one an alcoholic, one, one a teetotaler, but two great football minds. And just fantastic memories. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, um, the players that you played with. Is there a is there a sense of regret? You know, when you started at Celtic, that you wish maybe you would dug your heels in and stuck around and and maybe you know toughed it out to see if you could make the grade there. You know, you know, seeing football, you've got to know when you're fancied and when you're not fancied, and. Billy McNeil signed me for Celtic. I was I was lucky enough that he signed me for Celtic, and I was always to the forefront when you know when younger players were getting an opportunity to go in trips and and uh, and he gave me my debut, and I played three times uh, for him, which was a dream come true for me, an absolute dream come true. But when David Hay came in, you just know when somebody doesn't fancy you, and. I went away and loaned to Dundee and uh, I had a fantastic spell. I mean, it was kind of a too good to be true to a certain extent. And I thought, you know, I think I can do this, but I'm not going to do it here because the manager's never really going to give me a chance. So I've never regretted that I left when I did uh, because I felt as though I had to really. And I also remember... I mean, when I was going to Nottingham Forest, I wasn't exactly going to... <laughs> Forest had just won a European Cup two years before. I always remember wee David Proven saying to me, I can't believe how lucky you are. But it was just... My ideal world had been at Celtic my whole life, but you just know when a manager doesn't fancy you. And, and uh, listen, I thought the world of David, he was a nice man. And when, when he offered me a new contract, because I'd done so well at Dundee, he was kind of embarrassed and he offered me a new contract. But he kind of said at the same time, I went to Chelsea. I left here to go to Chelsea, so I wouldn't really criticise you for leaving here to go to Forest, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I kind of, a, it wasn't a day utmost to keep me, you know. <laughs> and in a strange sort of way, though, you could have been, it could have been McAnally and Mick stay in the middle of the park. Oh, that would have been brilliant. That would have been brilliant. That's, then see, they spend the nine years kicking them. <laughs> Exactly. And of course, the other thing about it, which is I know you were great friends with him and, you know, the amount of times that we all spent together having a laugh. Tam Burns. Oh, I mean, I, I get back a wee bit with Tam because his father and my father used to socialise with each other. So we kind of went back to, to these times. Uh, and so I kind of I knew him for when I was a young player getting in there. And I took a few beatings off him and all because in the days it was a hard... It was a hard gig if you didn't behave yourself. You, they used to take you into the boot room and sort you out. <laughs> so, and then obviously when I went back to Celtic in 2000, Tam was was my uh, my boss at the academy. So we had some hilarious times and all then because obviously he was the assistant manager of Scotland. And uh, when things were bad, we used to we used to call him Osama Bin Burns because he used to get into hiding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he used to laugh about it. He, he was a fantastic man, and and uh, again blessed to, to have met these guys and worked with them. Yeah, he had, a, he had a great way. He could put you down with one line, couldn't he? Oh, unbelievable! He was he was he's humour, and it was 
I mean, I think I've, I've, I've already told the story of when the Rangers, we played Rangers use and we were two up and uh, pulled it back to 2-2 two, two in the last minute and I turned around and I looked for advice for him to say, Tam, do you think we should get back into defence now? And he says, well, if I knew how to beat Rangers, I wouldn't be standing with you two half-wits. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was just Tam Burns. Yeah, and, and the strange thing about it, when, when you look at generations and how we always want to see people um, you know, with skills and with technique in a strange sort of way because people played out in the street when they were growing up, they were actually honing their technique. Right. And, but Tam, I always tell people, Tam was the type of guy, if you chapped his door and said, are you coming up the park? And it was like half six at night, he'd, he'd go up and play. Aye. After Aye. he'd had that illustrious career. Oh, he was... See, even then, like, he was... He was your boss, but see, in the morning, he used to write, get the boys done, and we'll try and get started before he comes. Because as soon as he comes, we're getting to a passing drill for tours. <laughs> right? So what he used to do is he was try and pick the teams and get the teams picked, and he would run down... What team am I in, Jai? And he was just put him in his team so that he could play in front of him. He was down. He still had his suit, socks on. <laughs> <laughs> he could change that quickly. He forgot he still had his... And, and he just loved it. He just enthusiasm for football was... It was just unbelievable. He just absolutely loved being involved in football. And, and again, he used to laugh at me because obviously I was, I was just a worker and Tam had a bit of class to put him. And again, one day in the dressing room with the young boys... I was going on about, you know, he's need to work hard, he's need to do this, he's need to do that. And he went, are you day? He says, actually, I've got nine caps and he's got ten. <laughs> <laughs> he says, he could have lace my boots. <laughs> you know, so all things like that, brilliant. The one thing that, I mean, I know you'll remember this, but I, I can remember phoning him and saying, you know, I'm getting married, I want you to come to the, I want you to come to the stag night. And he went, oh no, we're not having a stag night. He says, cancel it. And, I, and I'm saying, Tam, I'm getting married. Don't you know, the boys all want to come out. He went, no, no, we're having a stag game. Aye. He says, get 11 boys together. And he says, we'll get the team together. And, and, and amazingly, I'll never forget, I've got a great picture that I'll never, ever lose, which is me, him, you, Starkey, Aye. Aye. in this side. And all my mates are in absolute awe. They can't even believe that you guys are there and we're playing football. But he absolutely loved it. Oh, it was, it was a brilliant a brilliant night, that, actually. Yeah. Really, really good night. But it was uh, totally different for a stag do. <laughs> totally different. I'll never forget the stag do. But from a playing point of view, you mentioned, obviously, you've got to read between the lines with managers when they say they don't, you know, they, maybe there's not going to be an opportunity for you, but my God, I mean, again, it's amazing how inextricably linked uh, your career and, and, and my path as a journalist because Aye. I had the great honour of sitting in Cloughy's house for an hour with a camera and just pointed the mic at him and just let him go. And he was, he was awesome, you know? Mm. From your point of view, I, I always remember you telling us the story about the when you first signed, <laughs> when, when you were all in the hotel. He had an unusual way of preparing for games. Oh, it was, it was, they were playing Man United that night. It was the last game of the season. They needed to beat Man United to finish second in the league. And obviously prize money in Europe and stuff like that was really important because English football was in the way in a wee bit because of Heysel and, and etc. the European stuff they were losing. And I get flew down and picked up at East Midlands Airport and straight into a hotel in Derby, Swallow Hotel in Derby. So he then comes and takes me through to meet the players who are all sitting at lunchtime before a night game. And he says, look, he took me out to Colin Walsh, actually, he was Scottish, just to, he says, look after him. He says, the lads are all having a glass of wine. He says, they'll sleep better in preparation for the game tonight. And uh, they beat Man United. And then comes and sits with me, right, young man, what are you looking for? What are you giving me? Uh, he tells me the wage and then he says, ah, then I, I, I plucked up the courage to say, is there a signing on fee? And he went, we don't do signing on fees, young man. And I was like, right, okay. I wasn't negotiating, I was just taking what I was getting and, and that was it. So he was, he was an awesome man. And you, you joined the team, I mean, obviously from your point of view, you mentioned young boy Castle Milk, he is an iconic figure. What were the? Give me a give me a sense of the teammates that were there when you joined. Well, when I first, <coughs> they were going on an end of season tour to Australia, 
which he didn't go on. So we're away for three weeks in Australia, right? And again, I'm thinking to myself, what have I let myself in for? Because for three days, I've never seen guys as drunk in all my life. <laughs> Viv Anderson, uh, who was, who'd signed for Arsenal, and was just away for a jolly before he went to Arsenal. Uh, Ian Boyer, uh, Gary Burtles, Peter Davenport, uh, Hans van Brocklin was a, was a goalkeeper, fantastic goalkeeper. Uh, Gary Mills, <coughs> Bryn Gunn, all guys that had won the cup, and uh, Steve Hodge, Colin Walsh. Terrific. They'd already beaten Celtic that season in the UEFA Cup. That's right, I remember it. Yeah, they'd Hodge already, scored. Aye, they'd already beaten Celtic. And, uh, but I've never seen guys drink like this in my life, or even guys have this power. Because we were playing the Australian B team the next day, and the night before, the players are all sitting, and there's oh, pints and pints on the table. And it's about half ten, and and uh, the assistant manager who's in charge, Ronnie Fenton, comes in and says, right, lads, uh, get yourselves off to bed now, you've got a game tomorrow. We're not here, we're, not, we're here for a holiday, the gaffer said we're here for a holiday, we're not going to bed. I've never seen player power, they just sat there and drank. I went to my bed, obviously, I, was, I didn't know what to do, I hadn't seen anything like this before. And uh, and that's just, it was just the way it was, I mean. Uh, so, so, so that was then, Viv, Viv left, Hans van Brocklin left, and then when we get back, Johnny Metgod signed for Real Madrid, Gary Megson signed for Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, so I was really blessed I was playing along amongst a lot of right good players. Metgod was a great player, wasn't he? Clough used to say that he made love to the ball. Yeah. That's what he used to say, John, just you keep making love to the ball. <laughs> Uh, he was what a lovely was guy, by the way, Johnny Metgod. A he? lovely guy. <clears throat> yeah, uh, really nice guy. He, he was one of those guys that he made hitting a ball from forty yards look effortless. Oh, oh he was. He was a lovely player. He was see free kicks and stuff like that. He was. He was a good player. But he, the, again, I couldn't believe how nice these guys were because when you used to see them from afar, you used to think superstars, but they were far from it. They were. Yeah. What was Clough like? What, what, did you get to, I mean, did you get underneath the surface at any time? Was there a, a, a personable, you know, way of chatting to him? Did you sense, you know, the man and then the manager? Aye, well, obviously, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an old story, but I had Christmas dinner with him at his house uh, because I was in a hotel. And uh, he says, I can't have you sit in a hotel. You come and have Christmas with me and Barbara and, and the boys and the family, so... So uh, he asked Steve Hodge to come to keep me company. And I mean, it was an experience in itself, right? Because he'd already known that I wasn't a good eater and I didn't like vegetables. So wherever we went for pre-match or the night before a game, wherever we went, I had to sit and face him and they used to make me eat vegetables. <laughs> so going to his house for Christmas dinner was going to be an ordeal. And he was, he was doing the cooking. But he was drinking as much as he was as he was cooking. Yeah. So anyway, Brussels sprouts are my pet hate in life and I must have ate about twelve without even they were just I was just swallowing them. He was like, right, eat your greens, young man. He said, eat your greens. And then as we get to the end and we finish, everybody finishes. And the family go because they know the better out his road. So they go and leave us so it's me and Hodgie and him. And then he goes, oh, blow me. I forgot your drumsticks in the, in the oven that, that he'd forgot about. So he brings you all these drumsticks. <laughs> Get them down, you. <clears throat> and you're sitting there eating. You're not even hungry, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, uh, and then we went through to the living room. And he told Nigel, he says, put on the Celtic game uh, for Jim when we beat them. And uh, it was the pre-match thing was, was uh, Greavesy and Ian St John. And he's shouting at they too. Yeah, yeah, you thought we would we thought we would lose, but we won the game, you two, yeah, uh, you haven't got a clue and stuff like that. But I just thought it's as good as it gets because that there's how human he, he is as a man that he he took his time out to invite me to his house for Christmas dinner. Yeah. What, did you like him as a manager? He was a brilliant manager. He was he he made you feel ten feet tall. Yeah. And see when you were playing well. He would pick on you because he knew you could take it. 
But see, if you weren't having a particularly good game, he would, he would, he would pick you up on something you'd done well, and make you feel better. Yeah, it's it's an art that um, you know a lot of people talk about the strategy, the the tactics, and everything. But psychology still has a part to play in football. Mass- massively, he would turn in his grave watching present day football. He would turn in his grave. I mean, if you as a fullback, your job was to stop crosses, obviously stop the winger playing well, get forward when he's had it. If you passed the ball into centre halves, he would consider subbing you. <laughs> uh, Neil Webb, remember Neil Webb? Yeah. So we signed Neil Webb for 400,000 for Portsmouth. And his first game, somebody rolls into him, first pass back, centre half. And you hear the voice coming out the dugout. One more time, son, and you'll be sitting beside me. So in the, in the second half, what happens again? Webby does it again, uh, subbed him. And what he said is, if I want the centre halves in the ball, I would play them where you're playing. Yeah. So that's what always, there's always an argument with me, what is coaching? What is a good coach? Clough said to him, if you can't pass it forward, then go sideways. If you can't go sideways, then you can pass it back. But you must at least try yeah. pass it forward. And for me, Neil Webb then went on to be sold for a million pounds and play for England. He was United. a good player, wasn't he? Terrific player. Yeah. But he had bad habits. And this present day football, especially passing the ball out for the back when you're no good enough to do it and uh, not passing the ball forward because it's all backwards and sideways. And then, and then eventually after 20 passes, he goes back to the goalie who launches it up the park anyway. Yeah. You know? So he would turn in his grave at present day football because for him, strikers should hold it up, get in the box, wingers cross it. Uh, it's so simple a game for him. Yeah, I, w- I want to talk to you about what impact that had on you as a manager in a moment. Did you get to play with Robbo? Oh, aye, aye. Yeah. He re-signed Robbo for Derby because it, it was such a shame. I got to know Robbo when he was at Derby. And uh, I used to go up and down to Derby with him and watch him in games. And Derby were in the third division at the time. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he got wind of the fact that I was palling about with Robbo. And him and Taylor fell out over Robbo. That was why they fell out, because Peter Taylor had moved to Derby and freed him a contract just came in at the time. And his first signing was Robbo. So there had been a court case and stuff like that. It had been pretty, pretty nasty. So he said to me one day, are you going about with a fat lad? <laughs> <laughs> and I says, ah, I've been going up and doing the games with me and that. Tell him to phone me. So anyway, Robbo phoned him and he bought him back. So I had the pleasure of playing, playing with him. But see, even in training, when you when you played against him, you used to think, he'll never run past me. Christ, he always did. Yeah. Martin O'Neill used to say that even um, uh, a, an old woman pushing a trolley in Tesco could beat him over a hundred yards, but over five yards, he could skin anybody. Oh, aye. you always thought you had him, but the thing was, you could go either side. Yeah, and he was such an intelligent player. I mean, obviously, he was past his best when he came back, but it was just a privilege to play with him. Yeah, absolutely. He's in my all-time top Scotland eleven. Aye, he, he's just. A, I just thought he was a genius. You know? oh, he's and he's a great guy. I mean, absolutely brilliant guy. I'm still keeping in touch with him. And, uh, I was done to see him in, in 87 80th there, so you know he's he's a brilliant guy. Yeah, you, um, which I think a lot of people, you know, sometimes when you're out of sight, out of mind. But Player of the Year at Nottingham Forest, it doesn't get any better, you know, when you're in that esteemed company. No, that was that was fantastic. Uh, and the thing was, that vote gets done with him, get with the supporters going in the turnstile, so. It was such a such an honour. And I always remember again getting getting Cluffy presented me on the pitch with the, with this with the it was like a salva. And uh, he went, I didn't I didn't know you were support with your son. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my dad had come down that day and he says, Bring your dad in for a glass of whiskey after the game, which was a bad mistake. So anyway, after the game I text my dad, I says, Gaffer, there's a... Uh, there's my dad there. He says, well, I'm going to do the press. Mr. McAnally, go and help yourself to a whiskey. So about half an hour later or something like that, I guess you hear the voice. Jim, 
That goes through. He says, "Get that man out of my office! He'll have no whiskey left." <laughs> <laughs> he was only kidding, but he, 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 he had a great humour about him like that, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and my, again, my, I don't think my dad could believe that he was sat having a bit whiskey with a great man, you know? Oh, absolutely, it's brilliant, you know. Uh, was it the best period of your life? I, I mean, form-wise, I, had, I just had an unbelievable season. Well, it only started actually in December, my season really, because Gary Mills got his leg broke and he was playing right back. So really, that my season was kind of a half a season, but I just just found it so good. And I think when you're playing with really good players, uh, and you obviously you've got you've got a great manager, but there were tough times at the time in English football because money was scarce, and uh, we were trying to qualify for Europe. And I always remember even the last game of the season we were playing a Friday night at uh, White Hart Lane against Spurs, and uh, I was getting married in the summer. And uh, he said to Big Johnny Met God before the game, he says, Young, he says, Johnny, the old man's getting married and he needs a European bonus. He says, Now we know how much you're getting paid. I know how much he's getting paid. So you get him his bonus. You know, so he was putting the pressure on Johnny Met God to deliver the goods and stuff like that. And he was That's brilliant was, psychology, isn't it? Aye. Did you get your bonus? No, we get beat we get beat one now. <laughs> My only claim to fame in that game was and and, and it's unbelievable. I went into a 50-50 with Graham Roberts. He went off in a stretcher. <laughs> and he said to me after the game, he said, young man, you've made my night. Because <laughs> he loved that tackle. Funny, funny, I was talking to Ian Boyer quite recently and he said something to me about it. He says, remember that tackle you made in Graham Roberts? And I actually can't remember it really. I, was, I think I was terrified because I seen him running for me. Uh, Graham Roberts never forgot it either when he came up to the Rangers. Yeah, I mean, from that point of view, you must have played with and against great players. So, so just give us a, I know it's a tough question at times, but who is the best player you played with in that period at Forest? Well, Robbo obviously was past his best, but he had probably, you know, if you're saying who's the best player you played, but Robbo would be, would be there. But guys like Ian Boyer and uh, were fantastic players. Ian Boyer's won European medals with Man City, Forest. Gary Burrows was a fantastic player. Yep. Uh, you know, so it's hard to say, but I mean, I would say Robbo was the best player that I played with. Yeah. And uh, and against? Just the, you've well, got, honestly, you see know? that season, Peter, we played Liverpool at Anfield, right? And the front two were Douglas and Rush. And again, it was a dream come true for me to be in the same pitch as kind of Douglas. And... We went. We played really, really well. Honestly, really well. The only thing I'd done wrong was is Ian Rush was a great guy for pressing you, and I, I nutmegged him, but I nutmegged him and gave the ball to them, and they nearly scored. I wasn't sure they had abuse I got for the for the side, but usually Anfield they're shooting into the cop a minute to go, penalty kick, and I'm standing there. John walks away to take the penalty, and Kenny Douglas comes up beside me and he goes, "Relax, wee man. He's missing." <laughs> John Watt puts in the top corner and they went only kidding <laughs> ran away <laughs> I was absolutely raging yeah. but it was just a pleasure to be in the same pitch as these guys yep. and it was always my ambition to play with Kenny Douglas and for some reason Mike Galloway invited me to play in his testimonial game yeah. at Celtic Park and Kenny Douglas was playing and that was that was my dream come true I know yeah he must have been in his 40s by then if my memory serves me correct but still in the head. I mean, I you're, you're lucky on a park. You must have seen his genius. Aye, yeah. Aye. He was a fantastic player. I mean, that's what you're, you're talking about the Galician rush then and that team. But, you know, we went there that day. We were better than them, but they, they got that penalty. But Everton were the top team. When I was in England, Everton were the champions. 84, 85. Aye. Yeah. And they had Sharp and they had Grey. Aye. You Peter know. Reed. Peter Reed. Adrian Heath. Stephen. Uh, Gary Stevens. Trevor Stephen. Yep. Uh, she did Pat Van Den Hout at the back he was a head case absolutely head case here guy so we beat we actually beat them they went in a I think they were after Forest record for going undefeated through a season and we beat them the last the last game of the season which was which was a great result I know did you miss Scotland at that point did you think uh, you know uh, I want to go back or you know because I think you went to Coventry didn't you uh, I did miss Scotland up until I started playing and then once because Archie Knox used to phone me Every day, just about to see if I come back to Dundee. 
Yeah. And uh, initially, I mean, not long after the season had started, <laughs> Clough used to say, OK, I'll let you go, but they need to pay 30 grand for you. That's what I paid for you. And they offered it in the, <laughs> they offered the installments. <laughs> installments. <laughs> <laughs> he says to me, young man, he says, that's not even included in my bung. <laughs> <laughs> and Archie was horrified. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it turned out it, it never it never happened. But uh, I'm glad it I'm glad it didn't happen. But the one thing I do regret is in that time we didn't train a lot. Very rarely trained. Yeah. And my youth was keeping and my playing was keeping my fitness up. And when we used to go for walks, we used to walk down the train. I was going to say to you, because there were times when you would just, you would come in, you walk around the train and that's it. Walked down the train, aye. And, uh, Did you, you do know. personal training yourself? No. None? No. That's, 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 this, is my, this is what I'm trying to tell you, is my biggest regret. Yeah, because I think he fined, I, I seem to remember he fined aye, a player who was doing his own aye, training. Aye, aye. But, so wherever we went, they say we walked a couple of miles or something like that, and then we would stop at a cafe or something. And he would get everybody ice lollies or cones or whatever. <laughs> and I used to always want to listen to his patter. Yeah. Right. And see the good pros? They ran back. Right. Ian Boyers, the Kenny Swains, they would run back. And that was their training. Yeah. But here was me. I would walk back with the manager and all the boys. And then we'd get ready and go to the pub. Wow. Did did you, did, I presume, apart from the walking, did you play a lot of five-a-sides? No. No? That's no. mental, isn't it? Aye. He, uh, he thought the less you seen of the boy, the more you would want it on a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes after a game on a Saturday, he would say, I'll see you on Wednesday. So that was you off to Wednesday. Wow. Now I'm in a hotel myself. These people were good to me. I got to know them. Their family looked after me in a hotel. Were you single? Aye. And every night, just about one of the players would phone and say, I can get out tonight. I'll pick you up. So I was out all the time. We went for pub lunches every day after training. I wasn't an alcoholic or anything like that, yeah. but I just wasn't leading a footballer's life, yeah. if you know what I mean. And my biggest regret is, is that if I wanted to have a good career in England... I really needed to get myself in shape because we even by the time I went to Coventry, what a state I was in. And did you, was that the biggest jump then for you was to say, right, I need to rejig my training programme to get myself fit? Well, I had no choice when I went to United, Peter. Yeah. When I went to Dundee United, Christ, I was so far, so far out of the picture and so unfit that it was scary. What did he say? He jumped. Oh, he wouldn't have tolerated oh. that. He called me up once to his office and he said, was it a part-time contract you signed? <laughs> and I said, no. He says, well, get yourself in here in the effing afternoons. So, so it was like, I had to train every afternoon. But by doing that, and with Stuart Hall came in, he seen, uh, was, at the time, he, he was fantastic. He took me under his wing and he got me super fit. You, you mentioned McNeil. You mentioned Clough. I mean, I've had so many United legends in here chatting to them on our show and my god there is there is a vein running through it with him he, he, uh, how would you sum him up he was a genius as a coach but he was a terrible manager uh, and I think that sums him up you know short and sweet really he was years ahead of himself in a football pitch but he was not prepared to change like Fergie was the same as him at Aberdeen. And then Fergie went to Man United and Fergie knew you had to evolve as a person. Weejam wasn't prepared to evolve. You know, he was just, it was his way or the highway. And, and uh, he, so you've got to differentiate Weejam's career because when he became chairman, he was bang out of order as a chairman. He shouldn't have been anywhere near the football club when he was a chairman because he just sat there and it was like he was sitting there trying to think how he could make life tough for you. Whereas when he was a manager, he was a different... Oh, sorry, the coaching manager. Yeah. He was a different man. And I always remember when he got rid of Golak and I was in the gym one day and he was in and he says, 
where do we go from here? And I says, you should take care of the team again. By the way, he was only about 56. Yeah. He was only, you know what I mean? He was 56 or something like that. Might, might have been 54. Yeah. And he went, I won't be responsible for this team getting relegated. And I says, we won't get relegated if you take her. But he wasn't, he, he lacked confidence. Definitely lacked confidence in his cell. Which is amazing that you would say that. Aye. It's crazy, isn't it? Aye. When you think of the teams that he built, the, the results that you guys had uh, uh, in that United side. I mean, strangely enough, when you talked about Clough, who sensed when you needed, if you were playing well, a wee dig just Aye. to keep you on edge, and then times when he needed to lift you. The one recurring theme I get from every United player is even when we won games, we were getting slaughtered. Aye. The biggest one for me, and I'll never forget it, was the, the 87 Cup final when we were already in the UEFA Cup final. But I think we'd played the first leg. And uh, It's against Gothenburg. Gothenburg. We'd played the first leg and we had this Cup final on the Saturday. And we were out on our feet. You know, I, I, I laugh at all these teams in Ousey saying that we've played all these games and whatever. I think we were at 68 or something like that. And uh, we were out on our feet. And we needed to win that game, you know, ugly, if we could. Yeah. And we did. We, we, we got a goal disallowed, which should have, to this day, an age was, was never, it was, a, it was a cut back in for Fergie and Kevin Gallagher bundled into the net. No, it, Kevin Gallagher went into the net and Fergie put it in and, it was somebody lying in the top of Kevin or whatever, but the goal should have stood. It was disallowed. And uh, anyway, we go to extra time that day. And guys like him and Bannon, who were super fit, Bannon had already been doing me cramp. And you're thinking, crazy, if he's going to do me cramp. We're in trouble. I'm in trouble, aye. <clears throat> so we get to, get to full time. And you're standing there, and this man runs on the pitch, and he's got a big black coat and it's flailing in the wind at his back, you know. And we're all standing in a huddle and he's like, you, fucking disgrace, you, cheat man, you, you, that went through us all, fucking disgrace. And you look to her and Jimmy Bone and Alex Smith were, come on boys, one last big effort here, you know. And I thought we needed him yeah. that day, we needed him so badly to try and pick us up. And I'm sure if he, you know, they were the things that let him down. Yeah. And he could have got more out of you because you were such a, I thought you were such a gifted and talented bunch of players. Aye, we, we were, but we were super fit. Yeah, before you joined as well, they were in the semi-finals of the European Aye, I know. Cup. I know, that was a better team than the team I played on, to be fair. Yeah. Was, was that team. And your team was a good team. Aye, but that team was better. And, uh, you know, I was, like Dave Neri, I was with him last week and... I always say they underachieved. We all underachieved, really. Yeah. And he underachieved as a manager. But so if you go back to him in the cup finals and then you go to the 94 one with Golak, the preparation was night and day as far as, you know, we can win this. We'll, Ivan, what they talk, we'll, we'll win this. And, and, and it was bizarre the way we went into that game, so, so totally relaxed. And, uh, and that was that team was nowhere near as good as any of the other teams that lost the finals. Yeah, yeah and you ended up winning the cup. Yeah, um, it, it, in a strange sort of way, you wonder if Jim McLean had the elements that maybe Fergie evolved into, and the elements that Clough had, what you could have won, what United could have won in that time. Because, I mean, I can remember you guys spanking, uh, you know, the good team of United. They beat Bruce and Munch and Gladbach. You know, they, they were aye, aye. they beat Barcelona. They were a really good side. Um, and then you guys are going all the way to the UEFA Cup final. You know, he's a, he, United at that time had a you know were a team that were feared in Europe. Ah, I know, I know. And tactically, he see, see when you go tactically, he was an absolute genius tactically. You could play three or four different positions in a game, and to this day. I still look at management now and think there's not enough managers. Look at the opposition and, and uh, they always look at their own team and they don't look at how they can change change a game or, or uh, stop the other team's best players. You know, it's like if you watch Celtic every week, right? It was like, so when we played Celtic, right? So every time, every team talk, McAnally, next day's your man. 
Thanks, boss. <laughs> Make sure he doesn't play. No, he knew that if I could keep him quiet, the rest of the boys would have a good chance of winning the game. Yeah. And so if you watch Celtic nowadays, if I'm the opposition, I'm saying to somebody, go and, go and fully Callum McGregor about the park. Try and stop him. Because if we stop him, who else is going to dictate the game for them? Nobody. Yeah. That doesn't happen now. No, there's a psychology attached to it. actually really. happened. I've seen it once at Celtic Park last year when Derek McInnes done it with Kilmarnock one day. And the boy just followed. And, and I think Celtic didn't score to about 70 minutes or something like that, but Kilmarnock done really well. And I thought, you know, I don't know why he may have, You know, present day managers, it's like they play their team, but they don't look at the opposition. Yeah. You, seeing that United side, just give us a flavour of the players that you played with in that, in that team. Well, you're, you're talking about Nery, Hegarty, Malpass, uh, Sturrock, Ian Redford, uh, Fergie, Ian Ferguson, Kevin Gallagher, uh, Billy McKinley then as a young player came into that team. So John Holt was a, so, such an underrated player. Uh, just that's real top team, you know what yeah. I mean? The, the, Mike, if I'd turned up for the five of sides, I'd, I'd, I'd have been panicking. Aye. And you just rhymed off those players. <laughs> that's outrageous, isn't it? I know. I know. And, and the thing is, I, I've told this story all the time. You know, we beat Barcelona right, in a new camp. John Holt was man of the match. Outstanding performance. And me and him are rooming with each other. We're lying up in bed with cans of coke, Mars bars or whatever. And I think we're watching a replay of the game on the telly. And he says, I've got a big decision to make. I says, what's that? We Jim's want me to go to Forfa. <laughs> and he says, what do you think? They're going to give me a motor. I went, are you kidding me? You've just been man in the match against Barcelona and you're contemplating going to Forfa. And that was wee Jim's failing. Yeah. He kept his guys there, down there, so that he could control them, rather than build them up and give them that belief. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there was a halfway house that he never ever was prepared to go to. It was always keeping them keeping them down all the time. You know. After after United, I mean, I I can remember. You know, I was commentating uh, times when you were playing with Wraith Rovers as well. Right. Um, after it was, were there any particular highs as you, you know, because you've you've had that Nottingham Forest, you've had that situation with United. You know, you more than a few clubs I looked at. You know, United. Then it's Dundee, Sligo, East Fife. At that point, do you... He's five, is a no-no. Yeah. Somebody's put that in my Wikipedia, so Peter, you could be the one to... I'll, I'll I never, I that. never played for these five. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a mad situation, but after United, is it a, is Aye. It, is it, is it a downward spiral in Aye. your head? Aye, you're to <laughs> totally right. And I think what happens is, I know... We get flogged a wee bit at United, training-wise and all the rest of it. And I think what happens is, is that when you get to 30, 31, you're not as fit as you were, if you know what I mean. You're maybe starting to feel stuff. And I went to Wraith Rovers and uh, Wraith were a, were a really good team at the time. And they were in Europe. And when they went, we played, I mean, I played against Bayern Munich for Wraith Rovers, but it wasn't my time, it was their time. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And Neri played Wraith Rovers as well. You know, after he was man United. of the match against yeah. Celtic in the final and went him, nobody even noticed. <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. I mean, I looked at that side. I can remember looking at that team and I'm thinking, I look back over that side and I think the calibre of player was yeah, unbelievable. Ian Redford was in that team. Yeah, Ian Redford was a great player. Ian Redford was in that team. Uh, but no, they had, I mean, Crawford and, and uh, Cameron there. Uh, they had a lot of good young players and it was Jimmy Nick didn't like me. Yeah. And I don't you know. I don't know his why. type of player. Well, I tell you what, I wasn't the player that he signed because I always remember one of my first games and he says to the boys, get Jimmy Mack on the ball. I was like, he doesn't know me. I can't play in the ball. Yeah. <laughs> You're stopping I'll go and, I'll go and get it back for you yeah. and I'll I'll pass it easy, but if you want me on the ball, your team's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. He did, Jimmy didn't like me. I, I don't know if it was because maybe he thought I was, I was getting too much money or, or whatever, but it never 
clicked for me and him and he actually they weren't as professional as what I was used to and that's not being you know disrespectful to the boys or anything like that yeah but I always even remember after we get through in Europe we were in Iceland on a Thursday night we were playing Aberdeen Sunday lunchtime at Pataudry and, and the boys were all sitting bevied and, and he was bevied with them just wee things like that I wasn't I, I, and because I wasn't getting involved I was castigated you were the outsider aye yeah no but the boys the boys were good aye but with him and I even remember supporters saying yeah you, you, you don't mix with the boys and that which wasn't true yeah but it was because I wouldn't drink with them yeah did you feel a tremendous pride uh, you know for somebody to say they even played for Scotland once would have been great aye ten's good aye I know I know I just, I, I can't believe I played 10 times for Scotland, to be honest. I wasn't good enough to play 10 times for Scotland. I wasn't even good enough to play once for Scotland, so it was a, it was an honour. And as Tam Burns got it right, <laughs> when he says, I can't believe you get 10 and I get 9. <laughs> but from you know. your point of view, you're, listen, there's, there's, there's many a times where sometimes it's just that moment, you're playing well, people, you come in and they ask you to do a job. I mean, your, your family must have been mega proud Oh, I, I mean, that's about the things I look back on and I've no regrets in anything. I, I've just been so lucky in everything that I've done to get caps and, and uh, you know, I just, just, I've loved everything about my career. Yeah. And, and even my management career. I mean, people say you're useless and all the rest of it. That's fine. But honestly, I've got so many, so many memories as a manager. Uh, and I'm talking about from Morton to East Stirling to Peter Reid. Yeah. Brilliant. I, I look upon your time and I think to myself, this is just my personal opinion. I thought I thought there was a moment in time where you should have been Dundee United manager. Now you might play down because of the nature of your you know, <clears throat> you're not exactly one of those guys who blows his trumpet. Mm -hmm. But I thought there was a period of time where I thought you deserve a tilt at it, you know. Um you at times I always felt when I was speaking to you, you were the reluctant manager, even although you had some great times and there was times when I thought you deserve the highest praise. But I don't know, what was your thoughts on being a manager? I would have loved to have managed Dundee United. That was the one club that I thought. When I left Morton, I kind of I got a scunner with full-time management. But as time went on and I'd watched United managers fail, fail, fail and I thought that's the one club I would like to go into and and have a go at it, you know. And uh, Stephen Thompson did phone me one time and asked me to meet him for a coffee. And uh, never phoned back to say when. <laughs> <laughs> Just a minor aye, technicality. Aye. Uh, you should have been the manager. So, and we Jim Spence had phoned me because he used to help him back forward. He said, would you be interested? And I said, aye. But anyway, it never happened. But it was the only job that ever I would have been prepared to get back full time again because I just find... I just find clubs in Scotland and I think, why would you want to manage the clubs? Because what do they expect? Half your managers. And it's still the same, isn't it? I mean, whether it's at Murn or Motherwell, or, you, you can't all win, but you don't get time. As soon as you get a bad run, you're out, you're sacked. Yeah. And uh, Let me talk to you about that then before we finish because there's a couple of things I really want to get your thoughts on. With that in mind... Were you lucky that you had a board at Peterhead who just completely and utterly understood where they were, what the expectation was, and what they wanted from you? Aye. The three jobs that I had were, were, were like that, by the way. I mean, at Morton, I had the brilliant chairman at Morton. Absolutely brilliant. And even when I resigned... Is this Douglas? Douglas Ray. Brilliant. He was, he was like, please, you know, change your mind on that. And I, you know, because I was, we, we, we get dogs abusing on a Saturday. And he was showing me emails for supporters that were supporting me, trying to, you know, it's not always, they're not like that, you know, and there's good supporters there and all the rest of it. But no, I did, I did enough. And then I go to the Shire, the worst team in Britain at the time. And then the last day, we, we, we go to second Boatman. I've never seen celebrations like it in my life. But again, the guy at the Shire, Spencer Fern, had put money into it. And uh, we had a good we had a good go for a few years there. It was it was, and then when I go to Peter Ed, the reality was that with the money that they had for the budget, etc., we should have been challenging for the title. But when I'm in, we were second bottom. Second season, Rangers came in, 
which he needed them like a hole in the head. Aye, but listen, one of the best voices I've got in my house is the scoreboard that Ibrox Rangers won Peter Head to. Yeah, maybe they'll take that away from me because as a Celtic supporter going to Ibrox and winning as a manager it was a dream come true. Uh, and then we went to a cup final at Hamden against Rangers, forty nine thousand there. Uh, fantastic memories and. And the board that Peter had, I mean, fantastic. And it, it's funny, the job got harder and harder and harder because there was money starting to get spent in Glasgow. The Lowland League teams are throwing money at it. So you weren't able to entice the better players up the road, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And uh, the job was just becoming harder. And I think even now the boys find it hard, the two boys that are running the team now, because, you know, y you've got to organise training in different places and... A tough, tough job. It's the same as being a manager of Ross County or Inverness. Yeah. Nobody wants to play for you unless you're throwing money at them. Well, the funny thing is, Malky Mackay said to me, he said, <clears throat> the toughest thing is, one, you have to pay a wee bit over the top. Aye. Two, you have to convince them to come in and embrace the area. And then he says, over and above that, you've got to get the odd loan deal, use your contacts. He says, so every year you're building a new team. Aye. And that's tough. Aye. With you... At Peterhead, uh, you know, there was times when I was speaking to you and I thought, you know, I, I knew you wanted to be fair to the chairman and say, look, at I'll resign and he talked you out of it. Aye. No, they, they understood. They, I mean, the, the vice chairman was, was Ian Grant, was a, he's a close friend. And he used to, he was, ultimately it was his money that was going into it. But he played, he played for a growth in that. So he understood. He understood the game. Yeah. He understood, he understood how hard it was to get players up the road. Uh, he used to come down to training and stuff like that. He knew, and that and what I always done was always told the chairman everything that I was doing and how I was training, and what my thought my thought was, and so there was nothing ever underhand with anything that you know. I always had a good relationship with him, and uh, you know, and I told the chairman at Peterhead about three or four weeks ago. I was speaking to him. I spoke to Jim Duffy recently. I spoke to Barry Smith, both, you know, were in charge of League Two clubs recently. And the stories that they tell me are horrifying, really. And the chairman said to me, will you get back in? I said, no, because after Peterhead, there's there's nobody else that I would want to work with because, you know, such a good part-time club, Peterhead. Uh, the understanding of the, how hard the job is, you know, the location of the club... But the real, also the rea the reality, yeah. of where you where you, your place is in Scottish football, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I just think it's great that you know we had two relegations. Well, I had one relegation, and I'll take the last one. I know because I left in October when you know when that season had started. But the other times, Chris, we beat we beat Hearts at Peterhead. We, we beat Dundee United at Tannadice. We beat Rangers at Ibrox. We drew with Rangers in the first ever game. I remember and. And live in Sky. Yep. Unbelievable times we had. Yeah. And, uh, it helped. Did, did you? <laughs> I always used to say, please don't let them lose McAllister. There's nothing like a goal scorer oh, to know, help you I along know. the way. But to be fair, by the way, and this is not, and I, I wouldn't even suggest, you know, just because somebody scores those amount of goals, you have to have a quality as a manager to build a team to get results. Um, what type of manager were you? Because you've mentioned the Clough. You've mentioned the flip side of a McLean. What type were you more a Clough? No, I was a, I was a players manager. I, yeah. I was a players manager. I, Can I, you still uh, be a players manager? Yeah. Like you could be. I could be. I mean, I think that's the only way to do it. You can't be something that you're not. And uh, I always remember, like, you talk about McAllister. I remember after about three weeks or something like that. And I used to try and coach him and say, you need to hold it up there, this, there, that. And uh, he wasn't playing well. And my mate said to me, look, leave him. He'll just score goals. Just concentrate on everybody else and just leave him. <laughs> and he was 100% right, you know. And, and that guy would bang in 20 to 30 a year. And uh, and there was always all these rumours, honestly. There was rumours going to be he was in a £1,000 a week. And yeah. what a lot of rubbish it was. Yeah, because he had a part-time job that was good for uh, him. It was just jealousy, you know what I mean? Yeah. There was just a lot of jealousy because, because the club had some money. But Yeah, I'll tell you a great story about him. <laughs> First year, PFA, Aye. player of the year, mum and dad there, sweet boy, absolutely fantastic. Second year, player of the year again, comes up onto the stage. 
brought his girlfriend with him. I thought, OK, things are looking good. You know, he's <laughs> third year, single, with the boys, completely rat ass. <laughs> <laughs> fell onto the stage, started singing a song, and I thought, wow, I can, ch I can chart your life all the way along. Oh, Such a good lad, but the boys, they were good fun. He was some boy. He was some boy. I mean, he, I seen him really playing against some Premier League teams and getting some centre-halves a torrid time because he was a big, strong boy and he could play. Yeah. But he just, he just, his life was okay for him, do you know what I mean? He didn't yeah. need that full-time life. Uh, he probably deserved it. He just didn't quite chase it. Who was the best player that you had under your wing that you, you really enjoyed and you thought, oh, that was a joy? Part-time? Yeah, any time from being a manager. Well, I'll tell you, see when I was at Martin, Peter Weatherson. Peter Weatherson was a fantastic player. Yeah. I mean, he got to the stage when he was a striker when I went, he got to the stage his mobility wasn't the best. I remember, I think it was the season we won the league, I put him to right back and I think he scored 14. Stepping into the game, it was different class. And Peter, listen, Peter used to turn up every day and I used to warm the boys up and you could smell the drink. <laughs> you could smell the drink, right. And uh, But see when he was in training, yeah. maybe he trained better than him. He didn't, I'm not saying he trained well or he was super fit, yeah. but he loved it. But it was when he was away for the away for the team. Yeah. But he was so talented. I mean, he, he I think he's without doubt the best player that I probably managed. Yeah. There are some players that can can take a drink and then train and then go out and play who are magnificent. I always think of Ryan Robson. Aye, that whole, aye. The people who can actually burn the candle at both ends. I think Mo Johnson's probably the best him and Maka probably <laughs> yeah, probably the yeah. best examples of guys. I, I was with Maka not that long ago. You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. right. Um, I'm going to talk about your personal life. Um, do you miss football? I don't because I've got such a passion for Celtic. Yeah. So I just go there and honestly I go and watch Celtic. I'll, I'll, and I sit there sometimes and I think, I've played here. You know what I mean? I sit and watch all these fanatics around me and, and people moaning and all the rest of it. Yeah. And I just think, nah, just, this, is, this is what I want now. Let's bring my grandsons, my wife. We, we sit and... and uh, I just love it. Yeah. If United called you tomorrow and said, listen, Aye. we need you to help us with you the manager. <laughs> Aye, of course I would. But yeah. um, you had a wee health scare. I was worried. Um, were you? Of course, of course. Uh, it's no news you expect to hear that you've got, you've got cancer, but uh, there was other things out in my life at the time, to be honest, that made it easier to deal with. And then you, uh, I made it, it was prostate cancer, so... I made the decision to get get it out and and uh, just a case of recovering. I'm I'm getting getting there. Yeah, I, I'm I'm so happy. It was it was one of those things where I, I you know when I contacted you last year and I, I got the news and I thought God you know I'm just going to stay in touch with you about the right times aye, aye. without pestering you because you, you 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 always want to give people their space. Did you did you reevaluate? Was there a was there a fear or was there a moment where you and the family just sat down and thought? That's the hardest thing is, is the family is, obviously my wife was was there when, when I got the news, but it was letting, how do you let the girls know? And I took the cowards away, I let her tell her, tell them. Yeah. But I was always, listen, I think when things happen in your life, and, and as I said, there was, my sister-in-law passed away at the same time, and my brother was my priority. So, my own situation was something that I could work on and at least I had a chance to, to get it sorted, you know what I mean? So I just got on with it and people used to say to me, uh, you know, you, you, you've, you've taken the news well and I said, well, at the end of the day, at least I've got a chance. Some people don't get a chance. Uh, they found it at the right time, it was contained and uh, and I say I got the operation and, and uh, you just got on with it. And, and you de-evaluate your life. I mean, I, I've always, I've got no regrets about anything. I just feel as though I've been so blessed in my life that, you know, I've, I've, I've no desires to get back into football because I didn't have any friends in football, Peter. Like everybody else, so you get a job somewhere. <laughs> well, nobody's going to give me a job because I've no pals. <laughs> so, family's everything to me, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you, 
Captain, with all due respect, you had a few. You'd, you'd me if you needed a game of fives or elevens for fuck's sake. Uh, no, but, but you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I didn't, I never networked. No. Never, never no, in the you, boardrooms. You weren't like that. I and even after that. games, I never ever done the old uh, having a drink with other managers because I thought, we've just abused each other for 90 minutes out there. <laughs> I'm not going to sit and kid on everything's rosy and we like each other and I never I never done that. Yeah. You know, people probably thought it was a weird though, but I just kept myself to myself. But I'll tell you one thing which is good though, you've got a you've got a message and a lesson for people who look and say, Well Jim McAnally's delighted that he's come out the other end of it. It's it's really a lesson to other people to say, get checked, oh, get aye, on aye. it. Aye, aye, that's a, it's a massive message. It's something I thought long and hard about actually, uh, to tell people and but you know, Simon Jordan was the first person that, that I'd heard about it. And uh, and then he obviously came out and, and that's, I'd say, give yourself a chance because people say to you, it's the best cancer that you can get. Well, I still know people that have died with it. So although it's the best cancer you can get, make sure that uh, you get it seen to you and, and because these guys are geniuses now, these consultants. And... Uh, and they can they can get you sorted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the tough question now is uh, now that you're not in football, how does the wife hand, <laughs> how does the wife handle you? <laughs> you're there all the time. Oh, she's she's out working. Yeah, ah, she's out working. You've got that family plan down to a T, haven't you? Oh, at the minute, anyway. At the minute, <laughs> uh, it's absolutely brilliant, Jim. I, I, honestly, I'm I'm so delighted that there's a positive story to end on. I'm delighted that we've uh, taken a trip down memory lane with a with a lot of the playing times and a lot of the uh, the, the managers that you've worked under and of course your career it's been an absolute joy Jim McAnally thanks very much cheers Peter top man thank you